lots to and you've got lots to talk about. So let's get this party mm -hmm. started. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the second in a series of Conservation Ontario's uh, fabulous WIN network where you can uh, get all your learning at a distance. Uh, today we have as our speaker Elizabeth Straczynski. She will be discussing um, amazing aquatic insects with us today. She's brought to us by the University of Toronto Schools and for those of you who don't know she's also a great coach and has brought many a team to victory in Canada for the Envirothon. So um, Envirothon is basically like mathletes, but for environmental causes. And one of the categories is water and um, water related experiences, which is where Liz uh, came up with these amazing coaching videos. They're all on YouTube, so we can lurk around and check her out later. I've also been asked to remind you that as part of the WIND network, which is the Watershed Interpreters Network, um, there is a place to vote for the innovation awards that are going to be awarded on Friday. So if you haven't got your votes in, take the time on the website to take care of that as well. But at this point, um, I, for, as far as a land acknowledgement goes, I think today I'd rather do a water acknowledgement. And just, just quickly, um, most of Ontario it has a very rich and modern tradition through uh, First Nations, Indigenous Peoples uh, and Métis. And we're gathering on the lands and waters and it's our responsibility to honor and respect um, that water while we're going through today's talk because without the stewardship and um, taking care and putting back into the environment things that were taken out without thinking um, we wouldn't have this topic today so ladies and gentlemen i give to you miss elizabeth strzynski and please miss liz give yeah. us the scoop on bugs you got it. Absolutely. Not just bugs, because bugs is a very specific word. So let's see if we can. Wow. Let's see if I can actually. There it is. So I'm going to do a little bit of background about lentic and lotic systems first. Uh, please slow me down if I'm using a sexy science word that you don't know. Don't just, I guess you could Google it if you want on the side on your phone, but I'd rather sort of explain it. So as Bonnie mentioned, I am a coach for Envirothon, but I've also taken a, a bunch of courses in limnology, like the study of lakes and, and study of insects, aquatic insects in particular. And it's very interesting to see the uses of some of these invertebrates as well. And insects are exclusively freshwater. So we've got sort of a little division. And what I'm going to be talking about is exclusively freshwater organisms. And we're going to be looking at lotic systems and lentic systems. And again, if you don't know what those sexy science words mean, we will work on that and starting now. So I'm worried that you can't see the entire screen because I've got my chat open here, but uh, lentic and lotic systems, we obviously have a lot of both of these in Canada in general and Ontario as well. So lentic, it's like in French, la for slow, it's slow moving or still water. So ponds, lake, bog, swamp, so any kind of wetland. Lotic systems are flowing, hence the nice little mnemonic there. So it could be a river, creek, stream. So anything that is could be a trickle or could be like the, the Red River, like a massive river, uh, they're all lotic. So I'm going to look at different invertebrates from these different systems. This is really not a comprehensive list of every single critter you're going to see in either of these systems, but I'm giving you sort of a Coles notes on some of the really cool ones, some of the weird ones, some of the you know more common ones that you would see if you are doing some sampling with uh, your students. So, wow. So I'm just getting the hang of making sure I advance. Okay, I'm gonna minimize my, uh, my people, there we go. So Atlantic habitats, as in any ecosystem, organisms are going to distribute themselves according to their needs. And, and it's the same typical things. They need space, they need shelter, they need food, they need oxygen. So we're not going to say air, we're going to specifically say oxygen. So in the upper part or the photic zone, so basically the areas where light reaches, there is usually a lot of light, uh, hence the name. <laughs> And there's also usually a lot of oxygen. Now this can change depending on, you know, if there's uh, uh, you know, extra decomposition going in or if there's pollution, that type of thing. But for the most part, this is an oxygen rich area. The aphotic zone where there's a lot less light, there's not enough light for photosynthesis. Maybe it's too murky, maybe it's just playing too deep. There is going to be, uh, there can often be lack of oxygen down there mainly because there's no plants that are having a net release of oxygen. 
The two main areas within Atlantic habitat, and this is true for pretty much whether it's a tiny pond or a massive lake, there's a littoral zone, which is where light actually reaches the bottom. So you can have emergent plants or plants that are rooted on the bottom but poke up through the surface in that area, as well as the plants that can occur just on the sides where it's you know very shallow water. The point is, is that this adds structure, like a three-dimensional structure to the habitat. So this is a really good place to look for inverts. The rest of the spaces, you know, sure you can find stuff in there, but where the food is, uh, is where you're going to find the herbivores. And when you find the herbivores, you're going to find the, the carnivores as well. You can find stuff in the benthos as well, but depending on what kind of study you're probably doing in your field stations or, or sorry, your uh, conservation areas, or what kind of equipment you have for sampling, you may not be able to reach those benthic areas as well. And I can talk about uh, equipment for sampling benthos later. So again, Atlantic habitats, and I'm going to focus on the littoral zone because that's where it's easy to sample, especially for the types of uh, things that you're going to be doing. So that vegetation at the side, whether it's floating plants, they might be submerged anchored plants, they may be just floating purely on the surface like duckweed. They're going to be providing the shelter, food, oxygen, and basically a little bit of temperature control along those edges. And that level of complexity means that with that three-dimensional space and all that extra food from the producers, it means that biodiversity is going to be much higher on the edges, which makes it more interesting to sample, really. So there's different levels of vegetation. And again, uh, each some of these different species of plant, not just the sort of major categories, but the individual species of plant may have insects in particular that are specific by species. So for example, there's one species of weevil type beetle that lives only on one or two species of pond lily, for example. So I've got a video here of me sampling. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this properly, but it just shows you the sampling technique. You can notice that I've got a D-net because of the shape of the net. It's called a D-net. But uh, I apologize in advance. The wind is a bit uh, not great, so uh, or sorry, fairly high, so it makes it a little difficult to hear. So I'll just play the video and cross my fingers that everybody's going to hear it. Okay, let's see if I can get to my next slide. Now, uh, I'm just going to monitor the chat briefly. Did people yeah, ask, hey Liz. Did, could you hear it? Yeah, Liz, this is Karen. Yeah. And uh, just popping on to say that it was pretty poor quality and Christine had a good suggestion. So I've just turned off your video for now, um, hoping that that will help with any lag. And we'll try, if you have another video, we'll try it. But if not, then I suggest that you just sort of explain what the video was going to show for today. 
Yeah, maybe I'll just do that. That's probably a little bit better. And this next video was just showing you uh, basically how to sort. So I've got, I use a dish pan. I put a little bit of water from the original water source. And then I just basically evert all of the material into uh, like all of the leaves and, and the insects that I've trapped into the basin. So once they're in the basin, you can then pick the leaves out, give them a bit of a rinse and sh like basically you shake and rinse them as you pull them out because there are gonna be things clinging to that. Now, this type of quantity of sampling is qualitative, not quantitative. So it doesn't really matter if I catch every single one. Uh, it, you're just looking for sort of a, a ballpark in terms of what kind of organisms are there. So I mean, uh, since most of you have done this kind of sampling before, I'm just gonna go ahead and cruise on to the rest of the presentation. So the first question is like, how do I tell them apart? Like this is what the kids wanna know as soon as they get out there. Maybe you wanna know this if you're new to this sort of, sort of sampling. First thing, count the legs. If it is an insect, there are six, but there are a lot of larvae that will have none, the sort of maggoty type larvae, and that takes a little bit more finesse, but we'll deal with what we got right now. So number of legs, if there's six, it's an insect, and you can proceed if you've got some sort of a key. Is it an adult or a larva? So the main difference, if even if it has six legs, it could be a larva, but does it have fully developed wings? That is the key to whether it's an adult or larva. Now, there are different keys, like basically different taxonomic keys that are available for larva versus adult. Don't grab something that says, oh, key to the larval trichoptera and think you'll be able to identify the adult caddis flies. You won't be able to, okay? So again, there's that, that dichotomy. When you start getting into what order does it belong to or what you know species, that type of thing, look at the shape of the body, okay? Insects will have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Sometimes they're a little bit more distinct on some species than others, but the general size, like how long they are or how wide they are, how compressed they are with respect to the other parts is a really good key in terms of just sort of getting an overall feel for what organism it might be. The next thing, this is a, not a technical word, are the sticky outy things. So are there gills? Where are they? Are they on the abdomen? Are they on the end of the tail? It might be internal, so you might not see any gills on the outside. Are there any filaments sticking out of the end of the abdomen? Are there antennae? What do the legs look like? You know, that type of thing. So you can picture match. There's a lot of good, you know, field guide too. And especially for younger children, it might be worth your while to be able to locate the typical species in your area and make them a little picture matching like a little laminated sheet. You probably have that already. But if you really want to do it properly, you need to use a taxonomic key. And I'll show you one of the options that's actually pretty reasonable. And then there, there's a couple that are sort of will deal with pretty much any insect in North America, but that's a little bit farther than you want to reach probably. So I just wanted to quickly talk about metamorphosis. Everybody knows complete metamorphosis. So egg, larva, pupa, adult, right? The caterpillar, the cocoon, the adult moth or butterfly. Some of them have these types of metamorphoses. The thing is, is that there's quite a few species of uh, major groups of aquatic insects that do not have complete metamorphosis. So the baby or the nymph, we don't call it a larva, we call it a nymph. It looks like a miniature adult, so it might be shorter. It's certainly going to have, uh, you know, fewer gills, and not as well developed, obviously. And they certainly don't have reproductive structures, and they do not have full wings. They might have little wing pads that are about to ready to develop wings, but they don't need wings underwater. And as a matter of fact, they're sort of going to create more drag, and they'll be vulnerable to damage from predators. So we just wait until we emerge. Okay. So all of these two aspects, whether it's complete metamorphosis or incomplete metamorphosis, is a really big impact on how you can identify them. If it's complete metamorphosis, you need a completely different taxonomic key. If it's incomplete metamorphosis, you may be able to identify uh, larvae use it at, at most of their different stages because they've got multiple nymphal stages, okay? So let's start talking about the actual groups. So this is what we call the true bugs. If you want the sexy science term, it's hemiptera, okay? So bug is not just a common word for any insects. Entomologists hate the word bug because it's actually only one group. So how to spot a true bug? There's sort of an X-shaped uh, um, mark on the hind. Uh, like basically the wings will overlap each other and you've got a bit of an X shape on the back. It's a little bit harder to see. 
we'll go uh, on on this particular slide because it's sort of uh, uh, a bit zoomed out and blotchy, but that's what you're looking for. X marks the bug, okay? There's another giveaway part that you have to get quite close and it's a little bit harder to see on smaller specimens, but the sucking mouth parts is diagnostic for this group. Wow, how do mouth parts suck? Let's have a look at this. So there's a whole bunch of groups that have multiple parts like this. They've got little jaws for chewing on. Some of them have piercing ones and then the other chewing parts. They've got an upper lip and a lower lip. Hemiptera, or the ones that we were talking about now, the true bugs have piercing sucking mouth parts. So instead of individual separate pieces that, that move with respect to each other, they basically have a big drinking straw that they can use to puncture their food. Now this could be a herbivore that drinks plant juices, or this could be a, a carnivore that basically injects digestive enzymes and then sucks it back out, out again. It's like eating a hamburger through a straw after you've like regurgitated digestive fluids onto it, okay? Yummy! Uh, there are other organisms that have sucking mouth parts like uh, butterflies and moths, but they basically, it's a different sort of uh, subsection of the mouth parts. And this is more of a, it's almost more of a, a, a capillary action sucking rather than the actual vacuum pumping kind of sucking that the hemiptera do. You don't want to get bitten by one of these large ones, okay? Yeah, sorry, it, it is kind of uh, it is kind of visual, okay? <laughs> there are other uh, analogies. I, I I teach high school and and intermediate science, so they really respond to those weird visuals, okay? Sorry, I just deactivated. Okay, so there we go. So the piercing sucking mouth parts, again, are going to be uh, different in terms of, depends on what the organism eats. So you might be familiar with the box elder bug. These are the red and uh, black ones that are more common in the fall. But this entire section here, this is their mouth parts. So again, it's a, it's a basically a fused section of the mouth parts. They have two channels. One is for spit and one is for food. So there's like an output and an input. So they'll start digesting fairly soon. Like basically, as soon as the saliva hits it, they start digesting. So again, here's that sucky mouth parts. You can't usually see the sucking mouth parts from the top. You usually have to flip the insect over to be able to see these pieces. Now, here's a really common one. People have seen this. Uh, they're they're kind of cool because uh, they, there's a couple of, wow, sorry. Let's, oh, geez, sorry about that. Um, I'm not as familiar with Zoom as I am with G Classroom, okay? So they've got a really easy way to identify them. They tend to be really big, okay? The adults have got that, you can see that sort of cross. They've got leathery parts to the wing, uh, or sorry, a membranous part of the wing, and then a more leathery part. And where they cross, you've got that X marked the bug. They've got raptorial forelegs. What the heck does that mean, Liz? Raptorial means they use it for grabbing their prey. Hence, they're big biceps. If you turn them over and look at the underside, they've got a very long piercing sucking part. And you know what? You need to stay away from these. Do not handle these live things by hand unless you've got gloves on. I don't know where uh, what this guy thinks he's doing, but maybe because the insect is uh, on a smallish side, but these guys get to be almost 10 to 12 centimeters long. And again, you, you need to be able to watch yourself. Sometimes you can find these things, believe it or not, in parking lots at night. Now, apparently they mistake the shine off of the tops, like the screen, the hoods of the car and the, the roofs of the car. They, were, they mistake the shine uh, from the, the street lights shining down on that for uh, ponds. And they can fly because they've got these nice big wings, but they end up flying down into what they think is a pond and they end up crawling around in a parking lot late at night. So uh, there's some creepy things waiting for you in the parking lot late at night. Hemiptera have incomplete metamorphosis. That means that these guys are visible as small nymphs and they don't have wings yet. So you can actually see the striations from their abdomen. So these ones are, are fantastic. They're beautiful. Just try not to get bitten by them because when they inject that saliva into you, it makes for a really nasty bite. It takes a long time to heal. So here's the nymph. You can see the abdomen. The wings haven't uh, started up yet. Okay. So again, the babies look like the parents generally, just they don't have that, that sort of cross formation of the wings. So there's other ones that I'm going to talk to you about again briefly, like water boatmen and uh, back swimmers. But again, this is a juvenile version. You can see all the striations on the abdomen, the different sections of the abdomen, but there are no wings yet. 
Everything else is the same. It's just no wings and they're a little bit smaller. That's all. So here's another one of the common ones, water boatman, same thing, six legs, full wing. This is an insect, but again, it's still hemiptera. You can see that sort of cross shape on that the wings form on the back, okay? They do have sucking mouth parts, so it is a true bug. And these guys swim underneath the surface. You've probably seen this one, it's fairly common. Uh, Corixa is the most common genus in the area. And they can have anywhere from solid black to a lighter gray to sometimes striated like this. It depends on what species it is and it's fairly specific. You can see the eyes, they're quite large here and the sucking mouth parts are on the opposite side, okay? So here we go, there's a couple of different versions. Again, you can see that X on the back, water boatman because it looks like they're paddling around with these oars and you can sort of see part of a leg and part of the mouth part here, but it's better just to have it in your hand. The, the hairs on the legs end up basically broadening the, the, when they're propelling themselves, it broadens the surface area that they're swimming with. And when they pull the leg back again, those, those hairs fold back so they don't provide drag on the way back, only as you're sort of uh, moving, uh, they're trying to move forward. Another one that, that commonly gets mistaken for it is back swimmers. Again, six legs, full wings, adult insects. There's the X on the back that you can see with the leathery and then the membranous part of the wing. So again, true bug. The difference is, and I'll show you a comparison between the two groups, is that they swim upside down at the surface of the water. The boatmen don't necessarily do that. Okay, They're usually dark side up and light side down. Okay, as opposed to these guys that swim upside down. So here you can sort of see the mouth parts right here. They're sort of fused in the middle. They're not too long on this particular one. And you can also see, you see how the abdomen is all shiny back there? Basically they take down their own little air supply. So, whoops, sorry. The insects breathe through holes along the abdomen um, and these are no exception, but to keep those air holes full of air and not water, they have these hairs that are screen sharing. But they have the uh, they have the hairs on the abdomen that hold that little bubble of air near the spiracle so that they can actually breathe. And again, this is the uh, back swimmer. Okay, if you look at the two of them together, and once you get familiar with the species in your own area, it's probably going to be easy to tell your typical boatman from your typical back swimmer. The back swimmers tend to be a bit larger. Uh, the, the, uh, the head is a little bit, is about the same width as the whole body and the back swimmer, it's a little bit narrower. The front legs on the back boatman are more scoop shaped where they're longer on the back swimmer. And again, the, the legs, the side, the relative size of the legs is also a diagnostic feature and the general coloration. So these guys tend to have a darker notum and a lighter sternum. And here it's, a, it's a, still has a, 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 it's sort of reversed, okay? So again, this is not the best feature, this, this light dark thing, except for the back swarm, because these guys can come in all kinds of different color configurations. So not the best choice. The shape of the head, definitely good. Another common one, I love this one, it's so cool. It's called a water scorpion. So it's got this really long, narrow body. It's still the same sort of bug kind of uh, true bug kind of format. It's got the six legs. This long thing out the back is basically an extension off the end of the abdomen that they breathe through. Yes, boys and girls, they breathe through their butts. Kids love hearing these weird sort of toilet humor things. So I, I am gonna add it in just because it's true, sorry. These guys are very similar to like a giant water bug because they also have these raptorial legs. They grab prey items this way. And by, uh, by grabbing prey this way, they can then bring it up to their mouth. And they tend to hang upside down in the water. So this is gonna be near the surface so that it has a constant air supply, like a little snorkel. And the uh, front parts of the legs, it almost acts as camouflage as well because it just looks like a piece of grass floating in the water until you've captured it and it starts moving around. So there we go, those raptorial legs. So the head is here. The Blood, the sucking mouth parts are going to be sticking uh, like basically between those front legs. It's got a bit of a, sort of a notch on that front limb and these sort of backward facing uh, um, to ends to the leg to be able to hold on to prey. Very similar to uh, mantis actually, praying mantis, if you've seen the raptorial legs on those guys. 
Next one, Water Strider. Oh my gosh, are we still in Hineptra? Yes, boys and girls, we are. Some people call this a Jesus bug. I try and stay away from that because I don't want to offend anybody. So we'll calling it a water strider is just as easy to understand. So they have a little bit of oil on the surface of their legs and the way they make contact with the water is kind of interesting. It's fairly broad contact. It's not just the tip of their toes. So they're basically held up by water, like just the surface tension. So between the oiliness on the hairs and the wide surface, and just the fact that they're such tiny insects makes it really easy for them to skitter along. You can notice here that they've got these two front legs. These are the legs, the two pairs of hind legs are the ones they use for moving. These are raptorial again. And these guys will pick up, you know, insects that might have like a mosquito that's landed on the surface, like an airborne mosquito that's landed on the surface, or if a fly has fallen onto the surface, these guys will pick it up and uh, eat it. It's kind of interesting that they actually are uh, territorial and they will use their legs to sort of bounce the water and basically send out a signal to others as a, hey, my turf, get out of here, right? So you can sort of see, again, uh, it's a little bit more difficult on this and this diagram is not very, uh, um, not very anatomically correct. But again, you can see that X marks the bug on the back showing that it is a true, in, true bug. Next one, we are no longer in the bugs, boys and girls. We are now in the diptera and there's a lot of different types of fly. Now, Mosquitoes, you're all very familiar with mosquitoes, I'm sure. And uh, you probably, you may even know the different forms, but let's have a look at this. The larva is, uh, the common name is a, a wriggler and probably because they actually will, they do wriggle. And like the water scorpion, they have this little snorkel tube coming out of their rear end that they breathe through and they can break the surface, but uh, in order to move and, and to move away for safe from a predator. But for the most part, they like hanging out with that sticking out. They've got their head here and their mouth parts down here. And they're, they're not blood suckers, obviously, when they're in, uh, in the aquatic environment, but they do, uh, they do still feed. Once they reach the pupa stage, right, sort of the cocoon concept, they don't actually spin themselves a web or anything like that. They just use their last skin that they molted and they basically hang out in that until they're ready to go. One of the ways of identifying these is that it looks like a little comma with the tail and they can still move, right? But they have little bunny ears, little black bunny ears that, that stick up. And when they emerge to the adult, they basically are at the surface most of the time anyway, they basically crack open the back of the uh, their pupil case. Basically they undo the back zipper, right? So, and so the widest part of their body emerges first and they need a little bit of time to dry out. So they're basically perching on their floating uh, cast skin before they actually can fly away. There's a big shift between the aquatic version and the terrestrial version for anything that has uh, wings as an adult, because those wings are very delicate and very fragile. They only get pumped up full of uh, blood and, and uh, body fluids basically, and dry out after they're above the water. Okay, so there's a little bit of a stage in between that pupil stage and the adult stage. Sometimes it's in only a few hours, but it makes them very vulnerable to predation at that point in time. So uh, there we go. That's the mosquito life cycle. Now, when they mate, the female will actually drop the eggs into the water again, and they just descend straight to the bottom to hatch out into a larva. Some species of insect have very specific requirements in terms of, you know, the eggs are laid in the fall, but they don't hatch until the spring. Some things like the next group, I'm, the next major group I'm going to talk about has got larvae that last for up to five or six years before they can emerge as an adult. So here's that group, Odonata, which is the sexy name for the order, the scientific name for the order. But they're split into damselflies and dragonflies. And uh, knowing the exact difference may not make a difference for some of the younger kids, but it is easy to uh, tell the difference. So let's go. Part of the reason I'm showing you this fantastic image is because both the damselflies and dragonflies as larvae have this crazy lower jaw. So when it's all nicely folded up, it looks like, wow, it's like a face mask, just like we're all wearing nowadays. So it basically has this sort of face mask thing. There's a bit of a sort of a, a, an arm, an elbow, and then it's attached to the lower part of the jaw, okay? Or sorry, the lower part of the head. When it sees a prey item, and again, these are sort of um, uh, ambush predators, they're basically hanging out. And if they see prey item, this flashes out in a matter of a millisecond 
this lobe actually can open up and then close again because there's little little teeth along the edge and sometimes there's an extra long spine at the end here that allows them to grab onto prey items. So they are extremely predatory as larvae. So let's start with the damselfly. These are the easiest ones to recognize. Why? Because they're the only insect that has three leaf-shaped structures coming out of the rear end, okay? So again, let's go through the same identification rigmarole you would do with the kids. Six legs, definitely an insect. It has wing pads. You can sort of see like sort of shoulder pads here. Wing pads, they're not fully complete. Again, not until metamorphosis when do they, do they fully emerge. It's got a long, narrow abdomen, and uh, the legs, of course, are all on that second section, the thorax, where the, oops, sorry, where the wings are. And the three leaf-shaped gills on the abdomen, I know they sort of look like filaments in this profile, but are uh, sort of viewed from the top. But when you see them from the side, and I'll show you the next picture, they do actually look leaf-shaped. They have big eyes. Right again, typical for uh, predators that are sort of weight and trap predators. So they need those big eyes. They've got short antennae because they don't really use them as much. And that massive crazy jaw. So let's look at this. So here we've got, uh, you can see sort of the mouth parts where the, there's uh, different mouth parts hanging on, plus those jaws from that crazy bottom jaw that's already brought this aquatic worm to the larva's uh, face so it can eat. You can actually see some of the worm inside of its head, which is kind of crazy. The adult is also a predator. So again, humongous eyes, uh, really fantastic uh, maneuverability on their wings. And it can actually eat, take down things that are about the same size as it. This is not a mosquito. This is actually a midge, and we'll go into this later. But I don't know if you can see as well here the little spines on the legs. They basically, in order to capture things like this, they fly around with their little legs sort of splayed out a little bit that serves as a basket right underneath them. So between the arrangement of how they hold their legs underneath them and all those spines, it ends up forming a net that they can basically nab things directly out of the, the air. It's kind of cool. Uh, it's fascinating to watch, especially since these guys can actually move forward, backward, up, down. They're more maneuverable than a helicopter. And as a matter of fact, some recent research in um, the, how these guys hunt has shown that these guys invented how a helicopter's props move before the helicopter did. They can also anticipate where the food is going to be. They don't chase after it. They see the trajectory of the, the target and they plan their own trajectory for interception rather than chasing. So they fly a lot less than they really, uh, than they, they would if they were actually physically chasing them, like following them one-on-one, -on -one. not an efficient route. So, so if you can do a little bit of calculus in your head, like these guys can, you can intercept your prey item more easily. This is always a crazy process that kids love to see if you catch them at the right time. The problem is it doesn't happen every day. It's only on a very specific timeline and pretty much all of them emerge within one or two days of each other. But again, very similar here. You can see those leaf shaped gills on the end. Same kind of idea as the mosquito. It's, it crawls out onto a stick in this case. It splits along the back. This adult now crawls out of that molted skin. It sort of looks like a little ghost. And it basically hangs out in this sort of soft bodied stage, pumping the wings up so that those things that were basically developing in those little wing pads along the back are able to pump up and fully expand and dry out so that uh, the insect can fly properly. It's got a nice uh, huge wingspan now after it emerged from uh, that small case. Okay. Next one, same major group, but these are dragonflies. And what's the difference? Six legs, same thing. Wing pads, even more visible on this guy than on that other slide. And these guys are a little bit chubbier as larvae. And some of them actually have like a disc shape uh, to the abdomen. The weird thing is, is that they do not have gills on the abdomen. They have these sort of three little spikes uh, that you can see the abdomen sort of pulsing because their gills are internal. So they basically breathe through their rear ends. Now, obviously it's not through their anus. That's a little bit different opening, but they do breathe internally. The cool thing about this is too, though, is that if you bug them a little bit, excuse the pun, if you irritate them a little bit, they can actually 
fart the water and they can jet propel themselves away fairly quickly, faster than they can certainly with, uh, with just by walking. Same idea, the big eyes, they're again, they're sit and wait predators, tiny antennae and the same crazy, crazy jaw. So remember I said that I, they've got those, whoops, sorry. They've got those little conical bits at the end. They can have sort of a longer chubby body. Some of them are a little shorter body and a little chubbier and some of them are actually sort of flat disc shaped kind of abdomens, okay? Again, it depends on the exact genus that you're talking about, but these are all still dragonflies. Same basic conformation of the head same three little prongy bits and uh, same crazy jaw underneath, but very different than the damselflies. So both the larvae and the adults are predators. Uh, this, like, I mean, look at this. Who would take on something almost your size that can sting you to death? That's quite amazing. And here you've got, you can actually see the uh, that crazy jaw partly extended. So it may be just uh, sort of cleaning itself, cleaning part of its jaw so it's ready to spring into action next time. So how do you tell the difference? It's very similar to moths and butterflies, except that damselflies are the ones that fold their wings back when they're at rest and dragonflies have their wings folded out, okay? I'm gonna show you a close up of the head that shows you the difference in the head as well. So the damselflies, again, really big eyes, but they're sort of like eyes on either side of the sort of uh, oblong kind of head. The dragonfly has a round head and two thirds of it is eyeball. So that hence the, the visual predator thing. So they, they see extremely well, they can calculate trajectories of themselves and their prey items. So there you go. Uh, can you tell I really love this group of insects? Moving right along into flowing systems. So the organisms we were just talking about are almost exclusively lentic or pond type systems. So you should be able to see them in ponds. If you have a very slow flowing stream, you may also find them there. But let's talk briefly about lodic systems in general. So again, creeks, streams, rivers, these are really safe, especially if they're shallow for kids to be sampling in, but don't send them into a river with a soft bottom. You're just asking for trouble. Um, again, there's different substrates depending on whether you're in a riffle or a pool, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a sec. But uh, the dimensions of and the slope of the, the water body is going to dictate the physical and biological parameters for these systems. So you need to look at like where, like how deep it is, how wide it is, and a, a little bit of slope, for example. So how sloped it is is going to correlate with curviness. If it's a high slope, they tend to be steeper, obviously, or sorry, uh, like a, a straighter stream. Obviously, this differs if there's a lot of rock in the area, they're going to flow around the rock. And steeper streams tend to be at higher elevations, whereas if you get farther down, uh, you can have uh, sort of a sort of a, a windier type of um, habitat. And again, whether it's fast straight water or slower uh, windy water is going to dictate what kind of organisms you're going to have there and what kind of substrate ends up being on the bottom. So again, uh, there's sort of differences in terms of speed of where uh, whether you've got um, sort of an eroding bank or a depositing bank. If it is, uh, uh, if it's got a bend like this, the faster water is going to be towards the deeper end. So sort of towards the outer part of the bend rather than the inner part of the bend. And that's why it erodes on this side and deposits on this side. So you may actually find different craters on this side versus that side. Okay. So again, the type of stream is going to be dictated by the amount of flow or the, and the amount of uh, amount of slope that you've got in here. I'm looking at my time, so I'm going to kind of speed through this. Uh, most people in Southern Ontario, depending on where you are, you're going to probably have this kind of category of stream where you've got riffles and possibly riffle pool kind of uh, area. These braided streams are more common in rockier areas. I mean, you probably don't have this type of flow through most of the conservation areas in Ontario. But again, it, it changes depending on uh, the slopes. Most locations in Ontario will have this kind of riffle pool. So a riffle is basically a rockier area. There's a bit of a drop. Most of the finer sediments have been washed down into the pool where the water slows down. And again, you're gonna have different organisms clinging to the rocks than the organisms that are in the finer sediments here. So it's important to be able to maybe change where you're doing your sampling flip over a few rocks for sure, but you may also want to check what's in the pool. Even just a comparison is kind of nice because it can tie abiotic with biotic factors, which is even, you know, something in the curriculum in grade seven. 
So if you're living in a lotic system, oxygen is not the problem. That's only in lentic systems, okay? So that movement is gonna oxygenate the water. What is limiting is space, and especially space on hard surfaces, okay? So some of the challenges that organisms have is how fast the water is. Like, yeah, I've got lots of oxygen, but man, I better hang on for dear life because it's gonna otherwise just whip me off the surface. The water level is also going to change with the season. So if you have a very sudden snow melt, for example, water levels are gonna go high and velocities are gonna increase, volumes are gonna increase. So there can also be like extreme weather events that are also gonna change the water level and how fast the water is going. So the limiting factor is appropriate spaces for them to hang on to or attach. And if there's a lot of sediment going downstream, say from a construction site upstream, or it could maybe a beaver dam is burst, or maybe it's uh, just from an extreme snow melt, you can have some sediment interfering with the organism's gills. And just like you breathe in dusty air and you get all snotty and you have trouble breathing and you want to sneeze and blow your nose, it's the exact same thing with organisms with gills, except they can't blow their gills. They don't have nose hairs and mucus to be able to protect their, their, their breathing surfaces like we do. So what can happen is that the uh, gills get irritated, they get a lot of mucus building up and the organisms can basically not suffocate to death in a short, short amount of time. Quite often what they'll do is like, whoa, it's too murky here. And they just let go and let the water to carry them downstream to move to a cleaner area. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't depending on what the cause of the, the sediment is. But basically it can limit their ability to survive uh, and to feed properly and they're eventually going to move out of the area if they have a lot of sediment. The two food categories, and I promise this is the sexiest science words you're ever going to hear. Uh, I do mention it to my Envirothon people, but allochthonous and autochthonous input is where their food is coming from. So allochthonous is leaves and twigs and material that falls in from outside of the stream. Autochthonous is algae and plants that are in the stream that are, are growing on those surfaces. So again, just two major sources of organic input into this uh, food chain. Now, this is really important in uh, streams, the idea of boundary layers. So they have to hang on. The good thing is, is that the surface of the object that they might want to cling to, say some kind of a rock, is going to slow down the water to the extent that there is a layer of, uh, it's still water, it's still moving, but it's a slower velocity than being in the middle of the stream. So if they can cling really tight to this boundary layer, stick really close to the surface of the object, they're going to be able to uh, be able to cling for longer periods and, for, and through higher velocity water than something that basically sticks up into that high velocity water. So you see in a lot of these stream insects what's called dorsoventral compression. So basically they're flattened from their back to their stomach. And I'll give you a really good example. So this is a water penny. It is a member of a family of beetles, but the larva looks really different. It's like a little flat tur turtle. And what ends up happening, if it's alive, it can actually conform its body. So it's like a little torpedo, a little bit more heaped at the front and tapering towards the back. Whereas I know this is what scientists do when they, when they get money for research. If they're glued to a rock and they don't have that, uh, if they're dead, they're not going to be able to conform to where's the water coming from. They basically create a huge amount of um, turbulence that is going to make it more likely for that insect to be wiped off of the rock. So you can see here that you've actually got fairly laminar flow up until definitely behind the insect where it starts getting more turbulent. Turbulence is more difficult to cling on. So let's have a closer look at this group. Um, I'm not going to show you that other video. I'll just give you a link at the end. So water penny is the, is the common name. And this is what they look like attached to the rock. So you can see the front end, there's a thorax, and there's a whole bunch of different abdominal segments. And it basically forms like a little limpet. But because it is in segments, it can actually cling very tightly to the rock. If you were to look at the underside and if you dislodge a water penny from the rock, it'll actually curl itself up trying to flip itself over again. But it looks like your stereotypical insect. Here you've got the three pairs of legs. I've got a distinct head with antennae. And here these guys have got, instead of sort of leaf-shaped gills, they've got sort of hairy filamentous type gills. So again, this is a really common organism in Ontario streams, especially clean streams. 
So there again, uh, just to show you for scale, what the water penny is about the size of it is. The biggest one I've ever seen is about half a centimeter long. The adult beetle looks like your typical beetle. This one just has some really crazy antennae to be able to uh, probably to detect members of the opposite sex uh, on the wind or possibly food sources, but they look like your stereotypical beetle with the hard shell and then the wings underneath that hard shell. Now let's get full into this water quality BMI for the less informed are benthic macroinvertebrates. Now I'm going to dwell almost exclusively with insects because um, the other invertebrates are fairly easy to identify, things like snails and crayfish and things like that. So I'm going to focus in on the more difficult to understand or identify ones. So benthic macroinvertebrates that they use for water quality, my little acronym, my pet acronym, haha, is PET. So they, uh, the reason that there are these certain categories that work for water quality is that they're all animals with gills and they can be really sensitive to changes in material. And there was a, a really humongous USGS or United States Geological Survey studied. It looked at streams all across the continental US and based on the data that they collected for not just these three groups, but they basically collected uh, all kinds of uh, different invertebrates as well as water chemistry data, they determined that there are three groups of insects that if you measure these three, you can get water quality with an amazing amount of accuracy. So their whole idea was if you measure, if we can limit it down to like two, three, maybe four invertebrates that I need to look for for water quality, that means that we really fast and easy to gather this kind of information really quickly. So the PET stands for Plecoptera, Ephemeroptera, and Trichoptera. Okay, those are the sexy science words, but let's go through these in a sort of common language. The first one, Plecoptera, are stoneflies. How do we tell the difference? Okay, got my six legs, and this is where the sticky outy things are really useful. First thing, sticky outy things at the back. How many can you count? One, two, awesome. Two sticky outy things, it's a plecoptera. Another thing that you can tell, this is the adult, which uh, is not aquatic, so I just wanted to be able to sort of show you the two. Another thing is where the gills are located. So the gills tend to be hairy, not sort of fin-shaped. So they're hairy and they're in the thorax. So the, basically these guys have got hairy armpits or hairy chests. So if you actually flip them over, you can sometimes see that it's just in the armpit area, assuming you can say that it has arms. I don't know what you want to call it, but they also tend to have them on the chest. So that's for P. What's E? Okay. Oh, sorry. Let's have a look at some of the diversity. So again, there's a lot of different specimens, like a lot of different species, a lot of different genera of this group, there's a lot of different families as well, but they all have two sticky outy things, right? There we go, two sticky outy things at the end. And same basic body shape. Some are more flattened than others, some are dark, some are light, some have got markings, but again, two prongy bits, okay? Sort of looks a bit like a cricket, I guess, without the wings. So it does have wing pads that will then lead to wings. So two pairs of wings, two pairs of wings, same thing here, two pairs of wings so that you can see. So the next group the, is ephemeroptera. Look at the sticky outy things. One, two, three. Okay. M-A-Y. Three mayfly. Okay. So again, here is the larva. Here is the adult. The cool thing about the adult is no mouth parts. They're ephemeroptera because they're ephemeral. They don't last long because they don't eat as adults. Whereas the larva could stay in the water for up to five years. <laughs> just feeding, getting really big and ready for uh, adulthood. This one is kind of interesting, one that's got very flattened. I'll show you a few more other diverse groups. And the gills are on the abdomen. In this case, remember they were on the armpit for the Plecoptera and they're on the abdomen and they are leaf shaped. Okay, so they're like fin shaped. And when you guys actually have these under a microscope or a dissecting scope, you can actually see like a Mexican wave of those gills moving as they're uh, trying to breathe basically. So again, here we've got a bit of variation. Here's another really flattened one. Those are actually its eyes and they're basically staring straight up. This is more of a lake kind of species. So it's more like sausage shaped, but again, gills along the side shaped like fins with the little veins in them. Three prongy bits, three prongy bits, three prongy bits. And this one's actually in the middle of flapping its, uh, its gills. The last one, T for Trichoptera. Here's the adult again, uh, it, unless you have a light trap, you're probably not even going to see these. 
but the trichoptera larva is pretty diagnostic. They've got a very hard head case because the rest of their body, which is squishy, squishy, lives in some kind of a case. And I'll show you some of the diversity of that because it's kind of cool. Their front legs, especially the front pair, are pretty heavy duty because they use this for dragging themselves along or for uh, scraping, uh, helping them pull themselves along the surface where they're feeding. And the abdomen, you can see these little hair-like projections, those are all the gills. So they're protected, uh, the soft part of the body and the gills are protected by the case. There's a couple of little hook-like, like they're called pro-legs, they're not real legs, they're just sort of like pretend legs that help them hold on and move back and forth so that you can't easily pop them out of the case. So let's look at some caddisfly diversity. Um, again, there's the main parts of the body that are, are fairly tough, and then the rest of the body that is fairly soft, including the gills and that anal claw that helps them hold on. So here's some of the variation. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, alive. You can see it's uh, very green on the inside because it eats mostly algae. There are a lot of trichoptera that form sort of uh, nets and uh, algae and detritus um, formed shell, like uh, care, or sorry, coverings for that soft abdomen. These are the ones you're gonna find on the surface of the rock. And as soon as you brush it off of the rock, they'll come dislodged. And this is what you're gonna find in your sampling pail, okay? If you have them in a lake or a very still stream, you're gonna find some that are made out of pebbles. Uh, it could be bits of leaf or pine needles or both. The one in the previous image actually cut little sections of grass and, and made it for itself. Or if you Google caddisfly jewelry, you can find uh, this uh, researcher in France who actually basically popped these guys out of their case and provided them with flakes of gold and pearls and precious gems. And they actually made their own jewelry cases, okay? So this was uh, sort of a performance art thing. So whatever's around, that's what they're gonna use. Some of the other groups, I'm getting close to the end of my time here. Some of the other groups that you may see that may get confusing are alder flies or lace wings. Uh, alder flies have got these sticky outy things, but they're not gills. They're not at the end of the abdomen. They do have sort of predatory kind of jaws at the front and it's really uh, tough, um, tough carapace at the front, but a little bit softer behind. These guys are gonna be able to swim, but again, these are just extensions of the body, not actual, they don't use them to breathe or to swim or anything like that. And the adult looks an awful lot like a caddisfly. And again, you're not gonna see that unless you have a trap set for them. A riffle beetle, this is a really common one, but notice it's got the dark kind of uh, hardened carapace all the way down. They're really small. This tends to get confused with the caddisflies when they're out of their shell, but they do not have gills along the abdomen. They have gills up in this end. Okay, so again, another rear end breather. The adult looks like this, again, really small, usually a centimeter or less. Another one uh, that you don't want to have your hand in the water when this is swimming around, these can get up to be uh, almost 10 centimeters long, and they have, they're called predaceous diving beetle because the long jaws and uh, the adult and the juveniles are both uh, predaceous on, you know, these things are big enough that they can tackle tadpoles or each other. So again, those jaws are pretty massive. They can inject digestive fluids and then suck it back out again. And here you've got a big one eating. I really hope that's not the same species, but in any case, it's rather disturbing. But they can tackle uh, small fish and tadpoles as well. Okay, I'm getting towards the end here, uh, especially in terms of time. So I'm just gonna uh, quickly finish the last few species. This is another common one you're gonna find, these blood worms. I'm sure you've heard of them as blood worms. They, there are aquatic worms that are red like this, but as soon as you say segments like this, as soon as you see a head capsule, and especially if you see eye spots or little legs at the end, this is no longer an, a worm, it is definitely a midge. And the midge is the one that basically uh, hatches out into something that looks like a mosquito. They can be the same size as mosquito or up to like two centimeters long, depending on what species it is. And they do not feed as adults. They basically just they emerge as adults to mate and then they die. So again, pretty boring lifetime on, unless you're keen on staying a child for multiple years. 
Another one that this one's kind of gross. Uh, if you see it live, it's very maggoty looking. Uh, the adult is again similar to a mosquito, but not the same. They're much larger. Kids tend to get freaked out about these because, oh my god, it's so big. It's a mosquito. It's going to kill me. These guys, again, they don't have uh, those same mouth parts as a mosquito. They have large wings. These guys can have a wingspan of about maybe five to seven centimeters. So those legs can get up to 10 centimeters long if they're completely stretched out. Hence the freak outedness that people have. The larva, and this is what you'll be able to see in, uh, in ponds anyway, is kind of a maggoty kind of thing. This one's fairly stretched out. They're not usually this long. And these tentacles that look like mouth parts aren't. That's the rear end. This, this is where they, again, another butt breather. They take in air through the surface and the tentacles help them maintain contact with the surface tension of the water. But their actual head is back here. So I'm going to suggest some references for you. Uh, I can show you uh, the first one. I'm actually going to get out of my screen share. Yeah. Before you do that, there were a couple questions. Uh, humans were wondering, um, what do mosquito larvae eat? Mosquito larvae can usually eat uh, algae, uh, stuff that's floating in the water, basically. So plant-based or omnivore? Uh, you know what, they, if you want to count very small invertebrates as omnivore, then I would say omnivore, but they're not predatory. They're going to eat really small things. So they're Anything not opportunistic. Quite... Yeah, basically, basically. But the thing they can rely on fairly well is algae floating in the water. There's always algae in the water. Okay. And then the other one we were talking about, uh, I think it was the mayflies that uh, basically spend most of their time as uh, larvae. And then when they're adults, they don't last very long. And you said they don't eat. Yeah, that's true. Some of them, uh, some of them only last. Um, sorry, I'm going to try and get rid of that. There we go. Someone was asking about the lifespan, days, hours, uh, <laughs> not more than 24. It, it can't, it varies a lot. So if the larva packed on a lot of um, it literally, it's a lot of fat that they try and pack on. If they've packed on a lot of fat, they can last for a couple weeks. And uh, based on a marsh that I used to work in, um, they would hatch at a particular time, like a particular species would hatch. They would form these massive mating columns that on a still day, you could hear them, you know, going hundreds of meters up into the sky, into the air. And uh, then after they've mated, they, the females basically disappear and the, 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 uh, all of their energy then goes into producing eggs and the males just die. That's it. And this is super the way it should be. Yeah. Well, um, it's not, it's, it gets even worse. There are some species where the female doesn't even need wings, right? So the males emerge before the females. They're humming around the surface of the water waiting. Hey, baby, where are you? <laughs> They're waiting for the females to emerge. And when they, the female breaks the surface and starts emerging out of the back of that, that larval skin, the males will dive bomb her, mate with her, and then she just releases fertilized eggs on her way down to the bottom. So she's okay. Three, we got three minutes. more questions. Sure. What else? Okay. Uh, water scorpions, breathing tube, or modified ovipositor? Uh, oh, that's a really good question. I don't think it would and... be modified ovipositor because they would need their ovipositor. Yeah. So, um, and do males also have the um, breathing tubes? Or oh, is yeah, it just... they all do. They all do. Okay. You can't tell the sexes from that. Okay. And uh, do dragonflies also have two sticky outies or just the stoneflies? Uh, sorry, dragonflies? No, dragonfly nymphs dragonfly also have? Nymph. No, the dragonfly nymphs only have those three sort of pointy bits, right? They're basically, you know what, uh, if, if taken together, they're called the anal pyramid of, of weird names, what can I say? Uh, but basically, they're fairly thick, fairly uh, stiff prongs that allow it to protect its its rear end, because it's got some pretty important things in there, right? It's gills and, and the, the abdomen. So the, some of them actually have spines all the way along the abdomen, so that if a fish grabs onto them, they spit it out because it's got sharp prongy bits on it. So that, that anal pyramid, those anal prongs on the end are, are the same thing. There, th there are three of them, but they're so short that it's very difficult to count them. Unlike the mayflies that have got these three long filaments and the, um, uh, the stoneflies that have got the two long filaments. The problem is, is that if the, if the animals get mishandled, like roughed up a little bit while they're being sampled, the things can break off. 
So if you see two prongs coming out, make sure that you look at some of the other features because you may accidentally misidentify, say, uh, a mayfly as a stonefly because one of its prongs broke off when it was being handled. So look for some of those other features or look for the broken stump at the base of the tail where that third prong would have been. Smart and clever. Here's an interesting question, get ready. What yeah. strategies can we use to help children that are grossed out by insects in general? Um, it's uh, the no, the no touch them kids. I'm yeah, no, I them. realize that. But I mean, anything like that should be challenged by choice. You don't have to touch it, but it's nice if you could look at it or if they're really grossed out because, you know, some people have like honest to God arachnophobia or bugophobia or whatever. It may have been ingrained in them from a parent or it might even be cultural. Um, they showing them just a picture of it if they don't want to go close showing them a picture and showing them the cool things, the adaptations that it's got, and this is how it breathes, and this is what it hatches into, and this is what eats it, and this is what it eats. They can still get the general gist of it, uh, but there's not much you can, you, you sticking it in the kid's face is not gonna help, right? It's really not gonna help, and as a matter of fact, it may, uh, if some of their buddies are queuing into this and, and maybe they're very excited about, oh, look, this is so cool. No, no, Johnny, Johnny is not sure he wants to get that close to it, right? So if it's a bullying situation, you know, you deal with it as any bullying, right? Oh, I'm going to stick this in his face and make him scared, haha. Uh, versus just making them aware, you know, different strokes for different folks, right? And yep. I, you know, anytime I have that, I actually ask my students in, in my, my, you know, my grade 11 and 12 classrooms, if there's any, or my grade sevens too, if there's anybody here that has an insect phobia or some kind of phobia, I want to know now. And I get that like the first two days of school with their little biography. I need to know if you've got a phobia. If I'm bringing a spider in, I will warn you, right? And they're usually pretty upfront about it. And, you know, people have phobias like this and I don't want to trigger them. Like, what, what's the point of that? Turning it into a, a, a bad experience for them, right? Just, you know, challenge by choice and what they're comfortable with, they're comfortable with. Right. And I'm not planning on encouraging them to like, you know, everybody else is holding it. Why don't you hold it? There's no point. Right. It's just going to turn it into a traumatic experience for them. So and fantastic. Let them, let them pick how close they want to get. It's there. It can't crawl out. You know, it's there in the container. We'll bring it into the lab. You can stay on the other side of the room if that's OK. But, you know, more often than not, I've seen the kids get all excited and, you know, their friends are saying, oh, that's so cool. Oh, my God. And they're geeking out over it so much that the ones that are a little bit nervous will, will approach, maybe not get into it as much, but they will approach and they may, you know, if, if we've lessened their fear even just a little bit, that's all good. Excellent. Um, next nerd question. Uh, can you say there's a greater species diversity, say in a pond, that means that there's a better water quality in that area? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of variation with that, though. So uh, if you really want to geek out, I'm going to encourage you to look up some of the diversity indexes, right? So uh, one of them is a Hilsenhoff index, really easy to calculate. Do not try it with grade sevens. But if you've got grade, you know, 10, 11, 12, certainly should be able to handle it. Or you can do the calculations yourself and just say, oh, well, the biodiversity index is this. You may just want to do uh, species richness, right? How many species did we find? How many different taxa? So if you've got 20 different species of midge, which are diagnostic of poor quality water, that doesn't mean it's better than if you have 20 species or even 10 species of mayfly, which are indicative of high quality water. So this is why using uh, the Hilsenhoff index, which gives a different rating scale for each different type of insect. So if it's like a really high quality water, it gives you a really high number. If it's low quality, it gives you a low, like a, a you know, sorry, a high number. I mean, like a, a small number for high quality and a big number for poor quality. So you, you, can, you can actually, even if you don't do the full out calculation, showing the species index or sorry, the species richness, the species evenness and the species tolerance, just look up tolerance and you can basically say how many of these insects that you found were a high tolerant versus low tolerant species. And you can get more of a ballpark with that. 
Certain things are dead giveaways for high quality water, mayflies and mayflies and dragonflies for sure. Although there is some variation, there's like 20 something, 30 species of, uh, or 30 families of mayfly in North America. So you don't wanna just go on that. Um, but if there are, if there's fine sediment, if it smells like decomposition, it's gonna be poor quality water. If you can't see through it, poor quality water, right? So speed of the water doesn't necessarily mean better water quality, right? Clarity is one, the type of species that are there is another. Um, but yeah, you can actually tell. Okay, now here's, here's an interesting one about equipment. What's yeah. your, what's your top 10 or most, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to get the spectrum of the poor person, which is in some cases, some of our conservation areas or yeah. some of our students, um, our teachers that are here or um, to the high end, like not everyone's going to have like gill nets and things, but I what, so what's glad you asked because I'm going to go back to share screen because I do have some uh, images for that. Okay. Oh, so how frightfully convenient. So let me go back to I'll zoom down. Whoops, it's just towards the end. Um, where did I go? I'm, I'm amazed I got through it all, but there you go. My top 10 are definitely going to be your DNET. That's pretty basic. Um, and the, ha the fact that it needs a fairly rigid, um, fairly rigid edge is really important. Another one that's really cheap to make is this one, a Hester Dandy Sampler. What the hey? Okay, so basically all it is, is a series of plates. And especially if you can get, I don't know, uh, like pieces, uh, thin pieces of stone, uh, you might be able to get this as a, like rejects from a certain pot, like from a, um, a stone cutters or from people that make, believe it or not, people that make, um, what do you call it, uh, gravestones. Another, uh, so basically you set this out in the water for long periods of time and because it's a vertical, like it's a flat surface, it's a slightly rough surface, the organisms will colonize it. it. Takes a while to do. So this is something that you could set out in your pond and just leave it there. You wanna go super cheap with the exact same thing, get an onion bag, fill it with the same kind of small rocks that are in your stream, tie off the onion bag and leave it in the pond, and leave it in the stream, done. So that you can lift it out, pick it up, pick it up and dump it out. Uh, you can undo the, uh, undo the knot, dump it out and get the kids to uh, do it there. If it's raining and you don't wanna take the kids out to the stream or the stream is really high, and you don't want them to fall in or something like that, just take the, the bags of, of rocks, plunk them in uh, you know, a bucket, take them back to the, uh, you know, your little classroom area and give each kid a bag of rocks. They'll take it apart and you can have water pennies, you can have stoneflies, you could have mayflies, you can have all kinds of stuff growing on it, trichoptera, and they'll be able to see the caddisflies with their sort of silk cases attached to the rock intact, which is kind of cool. So you can buy the Hester Dendy things, fine. You can make them. Like, I mean, it's a bolt and a wing nut and a few chunks of uh, stone with holes drilled in them. Or you can make the onion skin or the onion bag, you know, the mesh bag thing yourself. You can use hardware cloth, I guess, too, to, to make those bags. Some of the more expensive things is a Cerber sampler. This is if you want to do quantitative sampling, right? So the standard Cerber sampler, you can tell where this was made and how long ago it was made. The standard surface area here is one foot. So you basically set this down in a stream so that the bag is downstream. And then with your hand or with a brush or you know whatever, you disrupt the surface, basically disrupting organisms that are clinging to or attached to the rocks over you know, a certain set amount of time, say 30 seconds, they get washed downstream into the net, and then you just have a little collection uh, bag off at the end. You can dump that into a collection jar or something like that. So server sampler, I'm sure you could probably make one fairly easily uh, with your own mesh and canvas. And, you know, I'm sure you could probably find someone that uh, can manufacture some sort of manu uh, like a metal frame like this. It works better as metal because, you know, wood floats. That's the best example. Another one you can use is, again, this is if money is no object, is some kind of a benthic grab. There's a million different grabs like this, but they're designed for sediment. And they basically have, you can do this by hand if the bottom is close enough to you, or if you're in a lake, I've used these in lakes, you basically pry it open, lower it down, and there's a basically a weight 
that once it's in position, there's a weight that goes down. It's called the messenger, goes down a cord and it trips a switch that then closes this trap. And then you can bring the trap straight up and the sediment is now in enclosed and it's not gonna rinse out. Unless you've got some plant material in there. I've had bad experiences with catching a big stick and having to go and sample again. They make these so powerful that they have, there's one called a ponar grab. Sorry, that's how much trivia I know. That's designed to work in gravel. So you do not want that open and set anywhere close to your feet. Okay. You usually set that when it's over the side of the boat and then you lower it into the gravel. Super. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the basic, like the basic thing, the D net, that's really nice to have because you can do the streams and the vegetation sampling, like uh, on, on ponds and things like that. That's the minimum you need. I've seen some people using aquarium nets and it's like, oh, you poor people. Cause like digging into the vegetation, those things bend so easily. It's too annoying. Right. I wouldn't want to try that. But the D net with a nice stiff edge to it and a nice stiff handle that you can do 99% of what you need to do with just that. I've done uh, kick samples with uh, one meter, two meter sticks and a meter of window screening. Oh, perfect. The yeah. Nylon, because that way it doesn't you can dry it out and it won't rest. And yeah. that cost me some duct tape, two meter sticks and some window screen. That and I yeah. had lying around. Yeah, exactly. And you, you know what? Window screen sews. You can sew it. I've sewn it, right? And that would be super cheap compared to what they make. Like the store-bought nets, like maybe not the D nets, but plankton nets, for example. They use Nitex screen and you can get precision down to 0.1 micron or whatever kind of thing. You don't need that. You're just looking for macroinvertebrates. You could, you know, window screening is plenty. Yeah. And um Someone had asked about if you don't have uh, lenthic or lotic ecosystems near your school, what are some ways of doing um, these ecosystems in the classroom or schoolyard? And I just, um, earlier in September, I had four pool noodles that I duct taped into a square and then put a shower curtain over it and put a bucket of bugs in it. So one of our stations was a pond and the kids could poke around with social distancing and check out <laughs> stuff in the, in the pond in the schoolyard. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, what I have done, uh, we do we do a fairly intense multiple day uh, biodiversity study on different streams. Like basically, I, I teach in downtown Toronto. The busing, just the busing, the, the amount of time to get us out there is just ridiculous. So what I do is I videotape myself. Here are my different sites. Here's the, like I show them a map of, you know, it's convenient for me to sample Peterborough because I live nearby. And I go out and I do the sampling. Right? I go out and I do the sampling. I keep them in jugs. Uh, we usually do it um, so that I have a long weekend, like over Thanksgiving. I do it over the long weekend and Monday and Tuesday morning, they're usually still the samples are if you can keep them in a cooler and there's a lot of head space or you can undo the lids, you don't have it. There's no problem keeping them alive overnight or even for a couple of days. So they actually will see them and identify them and watch the gills moving and stuff like that. So they, you can store them for short periods of time. You have a cheap aquarium bubbler, you can extend that as well. Yeah, that's true. But I usually do uh, five different sites, nine different samples because I'm trying to uh, accommodate. Um, let's see. I'm trying to accommodate four sections of about 20 to 25 kids each. Yeah. And we just had someone comment about pool skimmers work well as for, on, if you're yeah. on a sample budget. So yeah, yeah. that's true. That's true. I, I find the dollar store white trays are quite lovely. And yeah. I use a lot of spoons and a lot of paint brushes to remove stuff because sometimes kids with fingers, yeah. the younger they are, the more squishy things become. So I'm a big on I've old used, paint brushes and Q-tips. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I've used for uh, the larger ones too is just uh, like um, plastic spoons, right? Or you can even uh, you can even cut the bottom off of the plastic spoon or drill holes in the plastic spoon um, or make uh, the equivalent of a miniature pool dipper. So if you take a like a small triangle of um, window screening, jam it in the end of a drinking straw or wrap it like, you know, duct tape it or hot glue it to the end of a uh, chopstick, you can use that to sort them. And I certainly use like white um, ice cube trays 
So you fill them all with a little bit of water. And if you're trying to count individuals of different species, you just dump them into whichever tray. Oh, this looks like a mayfly. All the ones that you know, they don't even need to be able to identify what species they are. But if they can say, oh, three prongy bits with black and white stripes, you know, you can put them all in the same container and, and they're done, basically. I've also used turkey basters. Yeah, that'll incredible work. Incredible turkey basters of science. <laughs> that'll work for sure. So I'm just combing through the um, chitty chat okay. and I don't think I see anything else that needs to be answered. So okay. if, you, if you have a dying burning question, uh, you can unmute yourself at this point and pony up something good. Okay. I'm a lot, not allowed to show my video, so. Well, you, you can show your resources if you'd like while we're waiting for someone to get brave. Okay, we can do that. Let's just go back to sharing screen. And where was that? There it is. Okay, and back to space. So while Liz is dealing with her challenges in technology, we're still waiting to hear if there's any more questions or has she solved all the stream's problems in one afternoon? Whoa, hello. Liz, I'm trying to ask you to share your video again. I turned it off when there was bandwidth issues. Oh, okay. No worries. Let me get back to that. And where's my meeting controls? Okay. Just a sec. Uh, start video. There we go. Okay. Thank you. There we go. So there's the references. Uh, the Bouchard is, I actually picked this up. I know it sounds really hard to get at University of Minnesota, but I actually got this at Fleming College in Lindsay. Right, and it's actually pretty good. Um, the Merritt and Cummings is a, this is, it was a textbook that I had as, a, as an undergraduate and it's still like the source for it. Uh, the Bouchard is more recent, but not as detailed, but frankly, it goes into enough, like if you wanna to go to species, get the Merritt and Cummings. And you can probably get it at a books like used uh, for pretty cheap, although it's um, not the most common resource. The Bouchard, uh, you probably have to go through the University of Minnesota, um, or if you, you know, can uh, email or phone the bookshop at uh, at uh, the Frost campus of, um, like the Lindsay campus of uh, Flint, Sir Sanford Fleming College, they may still have it. It was they had it as a uh, text for a course they were teaching. Anything wow. else? Just just looking around to see if we can find. Um, there's also at the uh, University of Guelph, they have the placemats with the aquatic invertebrates on them. So they're all picture based. Yeah. And what I've done is I put Petri dishes over the pictures so that when the kids drop stuff in, they're matching what's underneath. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they can, it's like an instant sorting sheet. Yeah. And I use a lot of uh, Petri dishes and a lot of uh, yogurt tubs, a lot of spoons, <laughs> some buckets, yeah. and my, my kick screens. So yeah. that way we've got a big variety of things going on. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's a lot of, um, there's actually, oh, where is it? I think it's a, um, it is a Canadian site, but there are some online keys to invertebrates, stream invertebrates. Um, that you may want to have, you may have access to. I don't know if uh, a lot of conservation areas might not have computers for the kids to use, but if um, if it's a school situation, like if you're in school or if the kids have phones, they can access it off of the internet if they're allowed that kind of thing. Yeah, it depends. Hey Liz, I, I have a yep. quick question for you um, sure. about connecting it to citizen science, What you just said kind of reminded me that sometimes what we do at CBC is have tablets in the field. Do you, with your students, ever upload it, to upload your data to um, citizen science websites like Ontario Streams um, is out in the field doing restoration work, but then EcoSpark has their changing currents program. And so if they mm -hmm. can access one another's data, um, it might lead to prioritizing work, et cetera. Yeah, no, I'm not, I don't usually do that. Like I've already got them, uh, um, the, the idea behind the summative is more um, design, experimental design, sampling design, calculating biodiversity, making in, in, inferences about that. 
adding uh, citizen science team on top of it would be like the cherry on top, but we just we just don't have time. It's it's it was hard enough sell to try and get three days to be able to do like three classes to be able to do this experiment. Uh, actually, it count comes in more like four. So adding another day to do citizen science was uh, a bit much. But yeah, it's certainly some way if you wanted to go that way, for sure, that would be a good way of doing it. iNaturalist could certainly help with identification. I think it also it's regional if you're in like I'm in the Lake Simcoe area and there's there's uh, say Lake Simcoe there's stuff happening in Georgian Bay like there's a lot of interest groups that yeah. have got things going on so there are studies being done where data that the students collect can be used in other places yeah exactly okay. but it, there's there's no sense that you couldn't Oh, um, here's your next question. If you're teaching high school students, where do you start with ID? How, um, like, which characteristic is the biggest, most obvious that you start with? The sticky outy things? Uh, enthusiastically? Uh, the, the, the exact order that I gave you in the talk. Number of legs, number one, right? Number of legs. No legs, could be a snail. Lots of, more than six legs could be uh, amphipod, right? A crustacean. 10 legs, exactly 10 legs, probably a crayfish. Right. So uh, I would start with number of legs. And then, uh, you know, it's amazing. The kids often have a gestalt for a lot of those things. And I certainly like when I teach my environmentalers uh, bird ID, everybody knows the difference between the profile of a pelican and a flamingo. Right. So they realize that, hey, I know more about birds than I think I do. So if you show them a snail, they're going to be able to, they know what a snail is. Right. But the implication of a snail and you know the fact that that is not typical in a fast flowing stream or certain species are more typical in, in ponds than, than in slow rivers, that kind of thing, that, that is important. So to be able to get them to, uh, to start with those sticky outy things, yeah, you know, start, you know what, start with what's most common. And if they are at the space, like if we're talking grade 11 biodiversity, they need to know how to use a taxonomic key. This is a really good place for them to start doing that because they can certainly get it down to order really quickly and fairly simply. So the, the uh, caddisfly, mayfly, stonefly, those are, that's the, that taxonomic level, that's order. So they know it's an insect because it has six legs. Boom, we're already down to a class. To get down to the next level, it's then you go to the next sticky outy thing. So... <laughs> There's another really good book that I, I hesitate to suggest just because it's so old, but it has uh, really good natural history type stuff and everything, but it's, it's hard to get a hold of because it's old. So I didn't include it on this list. There's some really good uh, older books out there that, um, that have that sort of natural history kind of stuff. I just um, put, a, put a link to the Leaf Pack Network, which has uh, in their resources an amazing photo hyperlinked manual so that if you see this picture and it's exactly like Liz is talking about, does it have legs or not? And when you click the legs, then all the parameters come out and you click on what you're seeing and it keys it out. It goes into mouthpieces, it goes into body parts, it goes into bums. It's it's astounding. So that link is yeah. on the bottom. With that level of detail, you should be able to get to species. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like it's astounding. Yeah. But um, they, they also have a stone pack so that's, um, you could buy their stuff and get the very fancy onion bags, or you can just <laughs> use your own onion bags and then just get off this uh, website, the manual to go with. Mm -hmm. And it's quite lovely. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, going back to that, that equipment question, ultimately, uh, the only person that has to have a DNET is you, right? If you're going to be going out and doing the sampling, you need a DNET. Um, the permissions involved in getting kids into a stream are mental, right? Especially in the public boards, right? So uh, if you have a DNet and you have enough uh, shallow enamel trays, or if you don't have enamel trays, then, then you know, just Tupperware, sort of low-sided Tupperware trays. Dollar store stuff. Yeah, and then the, the, uh, the things to handle the critters, like you're saying, like three canisters or plastic spoons, white plastic spoons, or... You know, if you don't have forceps, that doesn't matter because they probably squeeze them to death anyway. Um, Paint brushes, like you were saying, all of those are good. And that way you can get, get your business taken care of. 
Yeah, and you can get the kids to get their hands on right away. So, but setting up stations with uh, like, I don't know if the school happens to have dissecting scopes to be able to do the identification or hand lenses, right? The only things that the kids really need individually are things to handle them, to store them and to, uh, to look at them. So hand lenses, like a class set of hand lenses, a class set of plastic spoons and like half a dozen trays and yep. you're done, right? As long uh, as you've got the net. We have one question about um, doing insect studies in the winter months. And I know when I worked at Wilmot, the water never froze over because it was constantly yeah. spring fed and we did insect stream studies year round. Yeah, Over the winter, things just get bigger because yeah. they don't emerge. Yeah. They're, still, they're still there. They're still there. So you can still do it. Uh, it's just nastier to sample. <laughs> so if you don't have uh, if you don't have chest waders that are lined, you know, that, that have got thermal soles in them and neoprene and that kind of thing, just sample fast. <laughs> and two minutes of pain for a whole afternoon of gain. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, sampling and in, in uh, especially if it's a rubble kind of stream is really fast. You can get a lot of things really quickly uh, because the mayflies and the stoneflies accumulate in the faster flowing areas because there's, uh, you know, there's more food there because there's more current there. And both of them are uh, also like grazers. They'll eat, you know, whatever dead stuff that, like whatever dead vegetation leaves and stuff that fall into the water or algae that grows on rocks, depending on the species. They're not predatory. No matter how big they get, they're not predatory. Um, someone's asking how long would you leave your onion bag in the water? How many days have you created your perfect uh, pickled, un pickled leaf kit? Longer is better. So I, I would say a week. Yeah, I would say like, I mean- At minimum. You're probably not gonna get as much if you just do it overnight. After about a week, like they, they move around a bit. So after a week, you should be pretty confident that you're going to have about the same distribution of organisms on the rocks that are in your, your leaf bag, or sorry, the leaves in your leaf bag or the rocks in your rock bag as you would on every other leaf pack or rock pile in the water already. The only exception to that is depends on what you put in the rock bag, right? So if you put cement, um, if the mm. cement is not aged, yeah, it's going to be really alkaline and they're going to avoid it. If it's rocks right from out of the stream that have got a nice healthy growth of algae on them already, then yes, they'll, they'll be there like within a day or so. But a week, you know, if the rocks are coming off of a dry shore, you're going to need at least a week, if not longer, for the algae to start growing on them and to be able to attract the... the yeah. No the, snacks, no attraction. Exactly. I don't want to go if there's no food. <laughs> my rule for every party I've ever been to. Um, any more questions from the crew? We've got about three minutes left. So I guess it's time to officially say, Liz, as yeah. usual, you astound me with your brilliance. And I appreciate you sharing your love of all things um, streamy. Yes. I'm, it's, no it, I'm hoping that people leave with more information and more ability to do safe stream studies and to reduce their impact on streams and to make things amazing. And I'm also being reminded that um, we need people to vote for the Win Innovation Award. So if you're a member of a conservation authority, this is your, this is your ball and you need to um, definitely uh, pick up the vote and um, the categories are on the website. There's two more events coming up. We've got the virtual um, forest walks are on Thursday and Friday is the campfire of awesome. So please don't forget to sign up and have more fun. It's a great way to have a break in your day. Oh, and everyone's just like, oh, Liz, you're awesome. Liz, you're amazing. Oh yeah, I knew that before. <laughs> That's why Such we're friends. Ego. Such an ego. Anyway, <laughs> I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. It's, uh, you know, it's not the optimalist situation. If we were all in the same place at the same time, it wouldn't be a pandemic. But uh, if we were all in the same place at, at the same time, I'd be able to have some specimens for you, even at this later date. Because you can, yeah. there, 
stuff out there, man. There is certainly yeah. stuff. So out. everyone, just just before she we we sign off, if everyone can turn their video on so we can just wave at Liz so she can see who the cast of characters were. I we appreciate you. Let's do that. See, look, everyone's oh, yeah. their eyes are open. People are awake. It was a good time that. for all. Okay. We well, miss. We I miss still, you. But that's all right. That's okay. Liz you doesn't know how to turn her video back on, but that's okay. I, but I at least but she can see us. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. That's what I've got. That's yes, my... that's. I oh, here we go. Start my video. Somebody's allowed me. Hi. <laughs> Anyway, so this is this is the this is the voice that's been in your head for the last hour and a bit, and she's yeah. phenomenal. And if you have further questions, um, by accident, I, I might throw in her email. Ah, <laughs> okay. And I'm also going to send. Uh, who should I send the links to for me? Those me videos? and I will. I will flip everything to this group so that you will have copies and all the videos and the links to her YouTube channel so that all the things that you could sort of see. You'll be able to see Liz yeah. playing in a stream and Liz playing yeah. in a pond and Liz playing yeah. with bugs because if you see it then you can be it so Liz I just want to thank you for do for pulling a solid for me and I guess now I owe you one damn it sure I'm okay with that <laughs> <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen have a fantastic afternoon and in my neighborhood it's been snowing and weird so um, wherever you're driving to just be careful and uh, mm -hmm. have a lovely pondish afternoon Bye. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Call me again when we can all actually go into the water together. That'd be fun. <laughs> yes, let's let's do that next time. For sure. So uh, thanks, Liz. I appreciate that as people are no checking out and we'll unrecord. So we'll stop recording. Okay. Yep, I'll turn that off stop? now and I'm going to end, uh, end the session. Okay. So Liz, peace out, baby.